This hourly segment is brought to you by Papa Nicholas Coffee. Papa Nicholas Coffee, roasted fresh daily in Batavia, Illinois. This is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. We have a number of legal matters to address with Professor William Jacobson, so let's get right to them. Professor Jacobson is a clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School. He's the founder of LegalInsurrection.com and president of the Legal Insurrection Foundation. Professor Jacobson, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me back. Uh, I wanted to get your take on the settlement between Fox News and Dominion, the $787 million settlement, uh, a, a complaint that sought a complaint by Dominion that sought $1.6 billion. Um, you know, I, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds in terms of the the particular whole uh, particular rulings of the judge on various matters, but there was a lot of evidence that would, made its way into the public domain, text messages from Fox anchors and communications between Fox uh, behind the scenes people with their on air talent, um, some of which I thought was. Uh, exculpatory, frankly, particularly Maria Bartiromo's text with uh, Steve Bannon, where she was essentially uh, hoping and asking if they thought they had evidence to uh, uh, present that would make it clear that there were there was rigging or there were improprieties that happened in the 2020 election, um, suggesting that there was no actual malice. There was a desire. There was a hope that there was something there. There was uh, fire where there was smoke, but there was not. It was not known, um, and actual malice, of course, is the standard here, since uh, Dominion is essentially a public institution for the purposes of the libel law. So, um, the uh, the propriety and the potential impact on journalism of Fox's settlement versus Fox going the distance and potentially losing a judgment. <coughs> Well, I do think it has a, a chilling effect. I mean, essentially what Fox was accused of is presenting people on air who presented facts that were false. So, uh, you know, we all in media present opinions and present people who, you know, tell their side of the story. And if that side of the story turns out to be defamatory, unless you, you know, were deliberately doing it, unless you were doing it so that it essentially becomes your statement, that's very troubling because Fox News, and I, I remember it, watching it at the time, they also presented contrary opinions. So, you know, uh, here's what one person is saying, but as you indicate, there's no evidence for it. So I, I think it does have a very chilling effect. I mean, very famously, I remember seeing it at the time, uh, and I think it came out in the l litigation also, you know, Tucker Carlson uh, inviting Sidney Powell onto the show to present her proof, okay, yeah. and announcing that she won't come on the show, and she, so she, there's no proof. So, I mean, how do you weigh that against, you know, in any given news show, any given segment, you may only present one side, but I think you need to look at the totality of it. And so I think it has a very chilling effect. Does that mean that in every single story, in an every single, you know, half-hour segment on TV, or in every three-minute radio hit, You've got to present both sides of the story. Isn't it enough that your overall coverage presents both sides of the story? And so I don't even know why it got this far. Uh, you know, uh, I didn't read the briefing for it, but I don't think the case should have ever gotten to trial because there, it's demonstrably true that both sides of the story were presented by Fox News, maybe more one side than the other. But they did present both sides of the story, and I think that's all a media outlet needs to do. Uh, contrast that with MSNBC and CNN, who, when it came to Russia collusion, were completely one-sided. Uh, right. You know, I think Fox was a lot more fair uh, on the so-called election collusion than MSNBC was on the so-called Russia collusion. Well, of course, the, it seemed to me the, the case turned maybe to, towards settlement when the judge held that— uh, there was false information that was presented on Fox, I, I guess, knowingly false information.
that was presented on Fox. And now the question is, did it reach the standard of actual malice? Um, and but once once the judge held that, it was like, well, this is not potentially going our way. And then the, obviously the financial exposure could, could have been much greater. But by the same token, um, it, 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 I. You know, I'm 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 not spending other people's money here, but but for Rupert Murdoch and company, um, going the distance on this thing to to the points that you're making, uh, if there was a judgment entered and that judgment was upheld based on the conflicting information that you know you have some information that uh, people were uh, arguably present allowing people to present in uh, an argument that they didn't necessarily agree with which happens all the time um and if if there was a a, a defamation judgment of a million a billion and a half dollars against fox then you're right i mean good, good you, trump is probably on the blower with his attorneys straight away to sue msnbc cnn new york times washington post and every other outlet in this country for billions just on the russian collusion case for starters yeah, I mean, I assume Rupert Murdoch made a business decision here that his franchise is worth a lot more than whatever he's going to pay in this case. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he didn't want his top 10 or 15 or 20 talent having to testify in court, okay? Mm -hmm. He didn't want that. And so I, I assume that this was a business decision that it's more important to protect the franchise than it is, you know, to pay almost $800 million because – you know, uh, News Corp, Fox News. I mean, I th I think I read someplace their um, revenue is fourteen billion dollars a year. So, eight hundred million is a lot of money. I'm not saying it's not a lot of money, but to avoid your top talent having to testify in court might have made it worth it. And as you indicate, there was a pretrial ruling that took one of the big issues off the table, uh, which is whether there was they presented false information. And that would not be appealable till after a verdict. You can't do like an interlocutory, uh, you know, appeal on some ruling like that. So, yeah, I think they made a business decision and it probably was a wise business decision just because it's more they're, they're It's a huge money making operation and they didn't want to do anything to jeopardize that. But, uh, the dollar amount is pretty crazy, though. Yeah, that's. <laughs> Yeah, it makes your head spin. But there's a similar suit from a second voting machine company. So what does it mean for that case with the Smartmatic? Yeah, well, I don't know what the evidence. I mean, I I think Dominion was the big one that was attacked. Uh, Smartmatic, I don't. I'm not as familiar with what evidence what was presented on Fox News or other channels. Uh, you know, they may have. I guess that's going to probably settle also, because you know we now have this precedent, but. You know, the $800 million, that, that's a lot considering that Dominion's total revenues, exactly. revenues, not profit, total revenues are under $100 million. So they got paid oh. a, a lot more than any rational damages. I mean, they did not suffer $800 million of damages, not even close to it. And that would have been an issue, too. But it's not an issue, again, that I think they wanted to risk having their talent, you know, take the stand in court. But $800 million cannot be explained by any actual damages to Dominion. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you would th think that a judge wouldn't accept a settlement on that order or wouldn't even accept a, a claim for relief in the order of $1.6 billion because— but I mean, this is just so this is just more jackpot justice. And it's uh, obviously it's precedent setting. Everybody knows about it. And it's going to encourage more sort of frivolous uh, defamation claims along these lines, I suspect. Well, you know, the core claim, which is that Dominion was defamed, uh, I think is is true. I mean, the outrageous things people were saying, you know, were were defamatory. The question is whether a news organization that presents both sides can be held liable for that. Uh, I don't think there's any question that the person who spoke the words, who said it was, I have the evidence that whatever, they were accessed from abroad, or I have the evidence that everything's hidden on a server in Eastern Europe. I mean, those people, there's no doubt, can be held accountable. The, 
the question here was whether a news organization that presents it as part of an overall coverage, which includes coverage questioning whether there's any evidence of this, should be held liable. Right. So I don't think it was a frivolous claim, but I don't think it should have been brought against Fox News. Well, that, yeah, that's what I mean. Organization. Right. But, but, you know, Sydney, you're not going to get one point six billion dollars from no. Sydney Powell. <laughs> um, no. So that but, and, no. but that's the that's what it inspires. That's the jackpot just I'm talking about. So, again, if I'm if I'm Donald Trump, I am uh, preparing my complaint against uh, Adam Schiff and Eric Swalwell and all the people who went on CNN and MSNBC and made the exact same claim. I have evidence. The evidence will come out that uh, yep. Donald Trump is a Russian agent. He is a the Manchurian candidate. He we have the evidence. We have the evidence. They said that for years. And yep. so if by this standard, um, you know, Donald Trump may be able to finance his presidential campaign. Well, you know, it'll take years. I don't yeah. know if he's within the statute of limitations anymore. But I mean, uh, in theory, in principle, yeah. In theory, in principle, yeah. I mean, you know, he in principle, he he could have sued just like Dominion sued uh, because there were crazy things said about him, factual allegations that just weren't true, weren't provable. But you know, for whatever his reason, he didn't bring those lawsuits. But Dominion did, and Dominion had, you know, very good attorneys. We're a very well-known firm that does, you know, defamation claims. And uh, they, you know, the other thing is, uh, imagine if Donald Trump was able to access years' worth of text messages, oh, and yeah. internal messages, and emails at MSNBC. You know, everybody's saying, oh, well, you know, privately at Fox, they told each other they didn't really believe this stuff. Oh, you can only imagine what must have been going on at MSNBC. They're probably furiously scrubbing all that material because, you know, that's what's so incredible is that if we were able, if people were able to go behind the scenes and dig into the electronic communications of journalists, I think it would be extremely ugly, uh, much uglier than happened at Fox News. I wanted to get uh, your take on this uh, uh, unnamed IRS whistleblower who, uh, through his attorney, sent a letter to uh, several members of Congress saying that um, what you've been told about the IRS investigation into Hunter Biden by Biden officials is untrue. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a continuation of the cover-up of the Biden family corruption. I mean, Joe Biden sold his office when he was vice president, when he left office and when he was planning to run for president to benefit his family. And the payments went through Hunter and the payments went through other family members that came out recently. Uh, And it's never been, it's been silenced by the media. And now there's a federal, you know, there's a a department of justice investigation and you have an insider at the IRS saying he's receiving preferential treatment and that the statements of certain senior appointees and various news organizations are saying that's Merrick Garland, the attorney general, um, were not true. Various statements to Congress were not true. And those statements were that there's no preferential treatment being given and that nobody is trying to quash the investigation. And this whistleblower is saying, well, that's not true. I'm a, I'm a witness to this. I have the proof. I want to be afforded the protections that the whistleblower statutes, uh, you know, give people, but you got to follow the rules very carefully. And that's why he hired a lawyer. That's why the lawyer is doing all this. And so this is a potential, you know, massive bombshell that that not only was the Biden family corrupt, which I think we all know it was, but uh, that there's a federal, uh, the federal government under the control of Joe Biden, uh, is actually trying to silence the investigation and and, uh, and stop it. And if that's all true, okay, this is, you know, through a lawyer, this is what various news media are reporting. If that is true, that's pretty massive. Well, I mean, if it's good enough for the FBI to try to spike the investigation, it's good enough for the IRS to do the same, I suppose. I'll, I'll look forward to Merrick Garland potentially being prosecuted for perjury right after uh, Lloyd Austin and Mark Milley are prosecuted for perjury per the uh, Pentagon right. leaks. Um, yeah, Mayorkas. Uh, He's on the s- list, too. So many. Mm-hmm. Uh, your uh, Equal Protection Project over at Legal Insurrection Foundation, um, you've got a new case. Missouri State University, tell us about it. 
Yeah, so uh, Equal Protection Project, which is EqualProtect.org, um, we are fighting against racism done in the name of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've seen a lot of cases where there is open discrimination against whites uh, uh, to advance non-whites in various programs. And we're against any discrimination, no matter which direction it goes. So Missouri State University had a, a, a business um, boot camp, they call it, that they ran a program and it was only open to non-whites and women. So it excluded white males. So every, anybody could apply. BIPOC is the term they use. BIPOC and women can apply. Well, who's left out of BIPOC and women? White males. So we have filed a complaint with the Missouri Attorney General asking his office to commence an investigation into what on its face is a, an openly racially uh, discriminatory program and that uh, they use their power and they have the ability to enforce the anti-discrimination laws to, uh, you know, put an end to this sort of conduct at Missouri State, because this is not the first time they've done something like this, and also to impose a remedy on them that would cure what they did. And what we're suggesting is that that remedy is they need to run a new program that's open to everybody. They need to, uh, you know, they need to make it right. Well, some may wonder what's what's the harm to white males or anyone else from the MSU boot camp. How do you respond to that? Well, well, the harm is a, is a constitutional and a statutory discrimination. Whenever you impose a barrier to one group based on race, the barrier is the harm. Okay, the case law is very clear. You don't actually have to have suffered financial harm yourself. The fact that you can't apply for it is the harm. And so they can't just say, well, you never applied for it or no white male ever applied for it. Well, of course, no white male ever applied for it because you told them they couldn't. They didn't qualify. <laughs> so that is Pretty the harm. Straightforward. They yep. He is Professor William Jacobson, clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell, founder of LegalInsurrection.com and president of the Legal Insurrection Foundation as well. Uh, and that part of that is the Equal Protection Project that he was just speaking of. Professor Jacobson, thanks as always for joining us. Appreciate it. Great. Take care. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. It's like a hot, steaming cup of information to start your day. It's Chicago's morning answer on AM 560. The answer. Let's talk about tomorrow for a minute. Chances are, someday, you're going to want to retire. And even though you'll stop working, you'll never want to stop achieving. You'll want to explore new ventures when you retire. You'll want to see and experience new things because you'll finally have the time to do it. But to get there, you'll need a financial strategy. Patrick Curtin at Morgan Stanley can help. Patrick is a financial advisor and he has more than 24 years of experience. Patrick can help you create a strategy based on how you want to live now and once you retire. He'll work with you and your attorney toward your goals like estate planning and leaving a legacy. And the great thing is, he's right here in Oak Brook. To make an appointment with Patrick, call 630-573-9769. That's 630-573-9769.